everyone, and welcome to Wellness Wednesday. I'm Caroline Berger, Director of Corporate and Community Relations for the University of Arizona Health Sciences in Phoenix. And I'd like to introduce our amazing team, led by Allison O2, our Executive Director, and Anne-Marie Medina, who is our Director in Tucson. And we're so happy that, we, that you are joining us today, and we invite you to stay engaged and reach out to us with any questions, comments, or feedback, or suggestions that you may have. We're here for you. Also today, our broadcast is going to be taped, so we also like to invite you to ask questions via the chat function, which you'll find at the bottom of your screen. Today, we're gonna to allow the first 20 minutes will be our presenter, followed by the next 10 minutes, and give you the chance to send us those important questions that you have. That's why we're here today, to be able to provide some great information for you. Also, you will, you will be receiving at the end of today a post-session email that will send you a link to all the resources that you see today. It will also include a link to a short two-minute event evaluation. So thank you in advance for filling this out and sending it back to us. Again, we invite you to share your feedback and ideas for future events for you. We are going to be recording the session, like I said, so you'll be receiving a link to that in the email as well. So be sure to send it to family and friends, and also we invite you to post it on your social media platforms as well so that you can share this good health news with everyone out there. And so for today, I am delighted to present Dr. Gustavo Perez, who is going to talk about staying connected and building resiliency. Dr. Perez, the assistant professor, lead psychologist at the Early Psychosis Intervention Center. He is a certified trauma specialist working with people experiencing serious mental illness. His work is grounded in a biopsychosocial approach to mental health. He leads the CBD Mindfulness Series at the Banner University Whole Health Clinic. He is also a community educator for the Department of Psychiatry promoting awareness of early mental health intervention for youth and families. Prior to joining the department, Dr. Perez was the senior psychologist at the Pima County Juvenile Detention Center, where he was recognized with the 2016 Employee of the Year Award. So it is my honor to present and please welcome Dr. Perez. Thank you, Caroline. And thank you everybody for being here today. It is my pleasure to be part of this conversation. Welcome, wherever you are. We will remember March 2020 for a long time. That was the month when we as a nation realized COVID-19 was a real danger to our lives, an invisible threat, a pandemic. That was the month that we sheltered in place Many of us started working from home. Our children started doing homeschooling. And we physically distanced from each other. And one question started to come up in our minds. So that question was, are we going to be safe? That is perhaps, in my experience, the most, one of the most basic questions we human beings ask each other especially in difficult times. Are we gonna be okay? Five months later, we're still living with those questions. We're still struggling with loss, and we still don't know how this is going to end. Now, I name this struggle because we must. As I tell my clients in session, knowing how we suffer is the first step to us here. I promise my intention is not to upset your lunch and assuming that you are eating and I don't want you to leave this presentation feeling more sad or depressed or with more burdens that you, are, you may already be carrying with you. The reason why I like to name this struggle is because it gives us a collective frame of reference to reflect around another important question that we can ask ourselves. How do we cope with adversity? The truth is that all of us have been affected by this pandemic and other struggles, for sure, in one or another way. 
One thing I like to say to people that I talk to these days, and one thing I would like to say today, today is if during COVID-19 you find yourself more tired, more irritable, more depressed, more anxious, nothing is wrong with you. You are having a totally expected reaction to a very difficult set of circumstances. We know life can be difficult. We knew it before the pandemic. We know it during the pandemic. This has been a time of loss, of uncertainty. The suffering is real. But we also know that as humans, we have the ability to recover from loss and adversity, to adapt to move forward and even experience growth. This amazing ability to recover from loss is known in the literature as resiliency. And just to give you some examples from the social sciences, Anne Masten is a child psychologist who has spent 45 years studying children who go through very difficult events like war or natural disasters. And her conclusion, study after study, is that resiliency in children is common, especially if they have a close relationship with a caring and competent adult. In another example, George Bonanno, a clinical psychologist as well, has looked at close to seven studies of people experiencing all kinds of traumatic stress from 9-11 to mass shootings to natural disasters. And he also concluded that two thirds of these people were able to function very well within a short period of time. Resiliency is real and is fairly common. Now, I need to say that being resilient doesn't mean that we are not touched by this adversary. Of course, we feel the pain, the anxiety, the fear. What resiliency means is that we don't stay stuck in the pain. We're able to move beyond. We manage a way to rebuild our lives, to even be transformed by the experience. That's what trauma therapists call transcending the loss or post-traumatic growth. Now, we have learned from the research on resiliency that it's not a fixed trait that some people have and some people don't. It's rather a process, a way of being in the world, a, 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 almost like an experience of being present and in constant, in constant transformation, excuse me, and in constant transformation. Now, if it's accessible to all of us, a good question to ask is, how can we cultivate this ability to stay grounded in the presence of real and um, difficult dangers? So what I wanna share next with you is some of the common threads shared by people known to cope with adversity in their lives. Some of these may be very familiar to you, and if I could pack them in one word for you, that word is connection. And I will speak to two types of connection today. There are some others, but I will speak to two types of connection today. Connection to yourself and connection to other people. Let's start with number one, connection to yourself. A good place to start is the body. We live in bodies and trauma researchers have documented that when we are faced with chronic adversity and we're unable to control the anxiety, the fear that we experience does not disappear. It finds a place in the body. And just think about the way we talk to each other when we're feeling unsettled or worried. We say things like, my body feels heavy, my stomach hurts, I have tightness on my chest, I cannot sleep, 
It's a very physical conversation. And many studies have proven there is a correlation between unresolved trauma or chronic adversity and chronic pain. Indeed, the body keeps the score, as Bessel van der Kolk, one psychiatrist, says. So, we have learned that if we're able to cultivate moments of awareness within our bodies, and I notice I say moments, we, we cannot do it all day, but if we're able to cultivate moments of awareness within our bodies, to simply notice what's happening in our bodies. That's an essential skill to better cope with life's challenges. Now, how do we do that? This may be familiar to many of you. The idea is to simply bring mindful attention to whatever is already happening in our bodies. Bring attention that is kind, attention that is non-judgmental. Moments of daily awareness lead to reduce stress, improve immune function, improve immune functioning, improve cardiovascular well-being, and less inflammation in our bodies. And basically what we are doing, we're practicing how to stay calm in the, pres in the presence of a danger. Now, we live lives of destruction in the United States. It will not be surprised to you that on average, adults spend about four hours in our phones, perhaps even more. We don't have a culture where we have learned to slow down and check with ourselves. It is true that in the pandemic, some aspects of our lives have, have slowed down. For example, we may not be driving to work anymore. But at the same time, other parts have become more complicated, just as the millions of parents who are homeschooling their children right now. It can be hard to find a place to check in with ourselves and a time. So we must be very intentional. The good news is that a practice as short as three to five minutes per day, if done consistently, can have a real impact in our ability to stay calm in the presence of danger. There are many ways how psychologists and psychiatrists and meditation um, masters describe this practice of checking with ourselves. I summarize it in three words that I'm gonna share with you. Notice, name, nurture. Let's start with word number one, notice. It's to simply recognize what our bodies are going through, our physical self, the way our muscles feel. What do we carry in our bodies? Discomfort, pain, some easiness? We do this noticing by bringing curiosity, the same curiosity that young children bring when they find a bug in their garden and they're trying to explore in a playful and inquisitive way. That's the kind of noticing that we want to bring to our physical sensations. We don't want to bring judgment. We don't want to bring shame. As you notice what's happening, and, and let me do one thing, I want to ask you, I'm gonna, I haven't done this before in this format, but I'm gonna try it today. So thank you for your patience with me. I'm gonna ask you for 10 seconds, wherever you are, just take a deep breath and just notice what's happening in your body right now. And then we move to the second step. Name the experience. As you notice what's happening, the second step is to bring words to it. So you may say something like, I notice some tension in my left shoulder. I notice my stomach is kind of wiggly. 
I notice that there is some tension on my neck. Just bring words to it. The idea is not to change anything, but simply notice and name. And then we move to step number three, nurture. What does that mean? That means that we welcome whatever it shows up, no matter how hard it can be. Pararaj, a psychologist, describes this process of nurturing as just allowing our physical sensations to be there and we sitting with them, sitting with them. We let them be. When I meet with clients in session, one of the things that I ask them to imagine is that pain that you are feeling, that tension that you are experiencing, just get a chair for it in your imagination. Invite them to sit down to the extent that you can hang on with it and see if he's trying to tell you a story. Maybe there is a message for you to listen. Notice, then nurture. And the very simple way of nurturing our physical self is sending some gratitude to it for it, for everything it allows you to do. It may seem like a very simple practice, but it has been demonstrated that it really helps to calm a nervous system from being hyper aroused. Now, another way to be present in our bodies and build resilience from the bottom up, meaning from our body to our minds, is to move. What we know is that trauma is about being in a physical state when you cannot do anything. So being able to be in our bodies and do something that you enjoy, like dance, paint, cook, take a walk in the neighborhood, some stretching in your living room. It doesn't have to be fancy. Any movement that you can do is gonna be critical to feeling alive and engage the core functions of your brain that keep you engaged with the world. If you are someone who has limited mobility, research demonstrates that even the act of imagining that you are moving your body can soothe your nervous system. In summary, being present with ourselves and learning to soothe ourselves is a very basic step towards building resiliency in our lives. And then I move to the second type of connection, connection to others. Connection to other people has been found to be the most important variable, more than IQ, use of education, social status, physical strength more than anything else that helps someone to deal with difficult events. Connection to others increases our sense of safety. If I know I can give you a call at three in the morning because I need to go to the hospital, I'm going to sleep better. And if you know that you can call me as well at three in the morning, it's gonna help us to cultivate a sense of mutual aid and protection. We must feel safe in order to grow. Connection to others helps us to feel safe. It also increases our sense of purpose. Sharing something with the other person has, that is meaningful to both you and the other pers person is gonna increase your sense of kinship or belonging, and it's gonna bring structure in your lives. Sharing something with others is so gonna is, is, is also gonna increase a common cause where you can bring your energy. Many things may not be working out. Many things may be falling apart, but you have this common intention where you are able to find meaning and purpose as that brings you together. And of course, being in connection to others increases our positive emotions. Our nervous system relaxes in the presence of the person you trust. It's just a gift. Now, if you are living alone, connecting to others in the time of social distancing is particularly challenging. And also, just because you are living with somebody doesn't mean that you, are, you feel connected to them. So how can we increase this sense of connection to others? One way to do it is to cultivate close relationships. 
And what's exciting about this research is that it has been demonstrated that having one, two, or three close relationships is enough to increase our sense of safety and an ability to cope with hardship. At the same time, being able to have daily encounters with people in our world, as simple as saying hi to the person who delivers the mail, or being very kind to the person who helps you with groceries at the grocery store, has a real impact in the way you will be able to cope with adversity. You will be more at ease with yourself and you will have a greater sense of hope for the future. And lastly, research has shown that dedication to a worthy cause, our belief, something greater than yourself, has very powerful resiliency um, enhancing effects. So one way to increase this connection to others beyond ourselves is become part of an organization that shares the same values that you do. It can be anything. Saving the environment, helping homeless youth, promoting local music, whatever it is. Being part of that community is known to increase a level of kinship that benefits your overall well-being. There are other types of connection, connection to nature, a spiritual connection that I won't be able to address today, but I will be sharing a list of resources that will be in your email that has a number of authors and researchers that I will invite you to explore if you are interested in this topic and you will find plenty of materials. I will finish by saying an African proverb that has helped me a lot in these times, and it says, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. And as we continue to face multiple challenges, we're going to have to go very far. And we must do it, stay connected to ourselves and connected to each other. Oh, that's wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Perez. Such wonderful words, information, and advice. Um, so please, um, we welcome your questions right now. Please send us um, your question via the chat function. Um, we have a couple here that we'll take now. Um, comment, one of the best books I've ever read is The Body Keeps the Score was eye-opening. Are you familiar with that one, Dr. Perez? Absolutely. That book has uh, been a sort of a revolution type of book. It's written by Besson Bardell Colt. His main um, thesis in the book is that for the longest time, psychologists and psychiatrists, I speak for psychologists since I'm, I'm one of them, we spend a lot of time talking about the trauma and talking about the problem, but we did not pay attention to how the body carries the trauma. And as long as the body stays in the, in, in, as long as the trauma stays in the body, we can talk forever, but it's not gonna get resolved. So he has a series of recommendations in that book uh, of things that people can do that go from things that I mentioned today, dancing, singing in a choir, and it is an excellent, an excellent read, and, and I would highly recommend it to, to everybody. Yeah. So the name of that book, for those of you who are asking, is The Body Keeps the Score. Um, another question, I was wondering what type of online virtual activities are most recommended to build community and connection to coworkers? Do you have any specific suggestions? Yeah, it, it all depends on what's the type of organization where you work and the interests that people like to do. I think that the place where I will start is, is have a conversation to talk about what I mentioned today. How are we struggling? What's going to help us to make it through these hard times? Here at the clinic, whole health thing where I work, we have had uh, several meetings to just check with each other and then ask the question, what is going to help us? It, it can be something as simple as having a dance party together. I know with my, with my family and groups of friends, we have played uh, games in Zoom. 
uh, for some other people is just being part of a common project where all of you contribute to something like uh, we're going to commit to each one is going to work uh, five minutes per day and then we're going to add all the minutes and we work collectively there's really no limits to what the imagination can come up with and that is part of why we are so resilient we can think outside the box great um you talked about you know taking a few minutes you know three to five minutes to you know, take care of yourself during the day is there a recommended best time? Would morning be best to start the day or afternoon or evening? Is there a preference, would you say? I, I, I would speak from my, from my personal experience. The best time to check in with yourself is the morning because at the end of the day, the body may be very tired. But, but again, this is it really, some people may do better at the end of the day. What's important is that you start doing it continuously that it becomes part of your daily life. And one way to do that is to do that check-in, notice, name, nurture, next to something that you are already doing. For example, if one of the things that you are doing every morning when you wake up is grab your cell phone and check your email, build five minutes in between you and your phone. Because once you open that email, it's gonna be very hard to close. And, and, and make a commitment to yourself. Before I check the email, I'm going to check in with my partner. Just one suggestion. I think that's great. I think that's great. We're getting so many nice comments in the chat function. So we want to thank you all uh, for that. And also, Dr. Perez, thank you for joining us today. We will have um, all of these resources will be included in the post-event email. So you will have that. And Dr. Perez actually has lots of resources that he's going to be sending your way. So this has been so helpful. Thank you so much. We invite you to stay with us for Wellness Wednesday next week, where we're gonna be talking about preventing desert dangers, discovering venomous creatures of the Southwest, featuring Laura Morehouse, who is the Community Outreach Coordinator for the Arizona Poison and Drug Information Center. So again, we hope you will enjoy us and please invite some friends, as you can tell from today. Um, we want to we enjoy presenting these information to you and we hope that you can take this information back and help you and your family and your loved ones through these challenging times. Thank you for joining us on behalf of our whole team, Allison, and Maria, myself. It is our honor to be here and to be with you as we go through this. And we remind you, stay safe, bear down, and mass up, and have a good rest of the week. Take care.